Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Um, as some of you know, my name is Liam and I'm a consultant with Marshall Day Acoustics in Melbourne. And it's my great pleasure to introduce today's webinar on acoustics and concert hall design. Just to quickly check the audio, if, yep, great. Now you can just a few thumbs up in the chat function if you can hear me, would be great. Just to make sure, can hear you now, excellent. Okay, so Pete will be presenting this talk externally in the near future. So any feedback on the running of today's webinar will be greatly encouraged. So before we begin, just a quick note that if you have any questions or comments during the presentation, please type them into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. I'll be monitoring these throughout the talk and we will answer them at the end. So I hope you enjoy today's uh, webinar, which is intended to be the first of a number of presentations delving into architectural acoustics and the design of performing arts centres. So it's now my pleasure to introduce our presenter, Peter Exton. Peter Exton is an acoustician who has worked on the acoustic design of many major concert halls across Australia and around the world, including the Paris Philharmonie, the Melbourne Conservatorium of Music and numerous concert halls and opera houses throughout China, to mention but a few. In addition to this, he has also had extensive career as a professional musician, having been a co-principal violin of the Philharmonia Orchestra in London, a member of the London Symphony Orchestra, associate concert master of the West Australian Symphony Orchestra and a co-concert master with Orchestra Victoria. Having such extensive experience as both performer and acoustician enables Peter to have unique insight into the varying requirements of a concert hall from the perspective of the audience, the musicians, and architects. So without further ado, over to you, Peter. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, guys, this is, um, a, as it were, a rehearsal to a, for a talk next week to a broader, less specialised audience. So please bear that in mind with, when I'm talking about some of our, uh, the topics which we share a knowledge of. Thanks very much. Here it goes. Hello and welcome to this discussion on sound and concert hall design. This talk is in three parts. I will describe some of the principles of what sound is and why the surfaces in a room can affect what we hear. Following this, we will discuss some significant historical concert halls and explain how these different geometries affect the listening experience for the audiences. I will then describe some Marshall Day projects and show how our design principles can be developed into a very wide range of different outcomes. This talk, of course, cannot be a complete description of concert hall design, but I hope that at the end, you will have a deeper understanding and share my view that room acoustics is not necessarily one of the darkest styles. My name is Peter Exton. I'm based in Melbourne, and I'm a specialist in room acoustic design. After completing a physics degree at the University of Western Australia, I continued my interest in playing the violin and completed postgraduate performance studies at the University of Tasmania. I worked as a professional musician for over 20 years in chamber music, in teaching and in symphony orchestras. For several years, I lived in London and I was a principal player with the Philharmonia Orchestra. Me in the, in the square, I'm near the middle there. On returning to Australia in 1995, I was concert, masters, uh, uh, concert master of orchestras in Perth and Melbourne, playing concerto performances, a lot of chamber music and tertiary level teaching. I joined Marshall Day Acoustics in 2003, where I've researched and analyzed the design of many performance halls and worked with many orchestras and clients to create new venues and to improve existing ones. My instrument is the violin. This violin was made in Italy, in Milan, in 1696, and I've been playing this instrument for the last 33 years. But a concert hall can also be considered as a musical instrument. Neither the violin nor the concert hall makes any sound on its own, but both are full of possibilities. Performers use their skills to provide audiences with their music through the sound of their own instruments as it travels within the hall. The character of different violins 
and the different halls provides inspiration to the performers. Both the violin and the hall influence what the audience hears. Very briefly, let's look at some of the basics of sound and how we hear the sound in a room. Of course, we are all surrounded by air. This is the medium through which sound travels. Air is compressible. A bike pump can move air under high pressure into a tire where the pressure is lower. But changes in air pressure can also travel through the air as demonstrated by moving a piston in a, one end of a closed cylinder. The disturbance propagates along the tube. Variations in the pressure of the air around us is what we hear as sound. The pitch of a pure sound corresponds to the number of variations in sound pressure per second. The higher the frequency of the vibrations, the higher the pitch of the sound. Pitch or frequency is measured in hertz or cycles per second. Humans can hear approximately 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz, and this range decreases generally with age. The notes on a piano range from about 20 hertz through to about four kilohertz. If air temperature is evenly distributed, sound travels through air at the same speed in all directions, approximately 340 meters per second. And not all sources produce sound equally in all directions. So those are some of the basic considerations that we think of in concert hall design. When sound strikes the surface, any surface, the energy of the sound can be reflected, absorbed or transmitted through the material. Inside a room, the reflected sound energy remains in the room and can be observed as part of the sound presence of the room. The absorbed energy is removed from the room and affects the reverberation time of the space. More of this later in this talk. The transmitted sound is also lost and can re-emerge in, in adjacent spaces and annoy the neighbours. In a concert hall, we generally make the wall surfaces very hard and massive to reduce the absorbed and transmitted sound. Now let's examine briefly what we hear inside a room. I've drew, drawn a rectangular room here, but the same principles apply to any enclosed volume. Here we see a direct sound from a source to a listener. But we know that the sound from a source can spread out in all directions. It doesn't select who will get to hear it. This image shows the path of a reflection from a balcony front to the listener in addition to the direct sound. The reflection arrives a short time later because the sound on this tra path travels further. The side and rear walls also provide reflections which arrive after the first reflection. We're showing the plan of the room, but of course the sound is traveling in all directions. So all the interior surfaces can create reflections that enhance the sound of the original source. In this way, rooms change the quality of the sound inside them. At a later time, more and more reflections arrive. Some of these have traveled around the room many times. These late reflections are what we call reverberation. Reverberation is the sound that appears to linger in the room. Reverberation allows the sounds of different instruments of the orchestra to blend together. Reverberation creates the richness of the orchestral texture. Now we can measure the sound that arrives at a point in the room using a microphone placed at the listener's position. This image shows the recording of a single burst of sound recorded using a single microphone. It shows what we mean by the direct sound, this part here, the early reflections in orange, and the later reflections which form the reverberation in the room. The direct sound and the early reflections, the orange and the green 
areas are clearly seen as spikes in the air pressure. They arrive very close together. Our human ears cannot respond quickly enough to hear each of the spikes as a separate event. The ear combines this sound energy together. We hear the presence of the early reflections as increased clarity and increased loudness. Some of this early, reflect, early sound arrives from the sides. The reflections reaching our two ears are slightly different as they have slightly different paths. And we hear this difference as envelopment. Envelopment is very important in creating a great concert hall. Envelopment helps us feel closer and more connected to the performance. Marshall Day Acoustics has recently developed a system for measuring the room acoustic response of a room in 3D. This uses a Tetra mic with four different microphone capsules, which simultaneously record the sound. The signals are processed to create an iris plot. The plot shows the reflections arriving at a receiver position. The length of the rays represents the strength of each reflection. The color of the rays is coded to show the direct sound, the late and the early reflections. This information includes the direction of the sound paths and shows the envelopment of the listener in the sound field. This in image shows an analysis of a room using the 3D microphone array plots. The sound source is located at this place, location S, and we've shown three measurement positions. The changes in the relative strength and direction of all the reflections between the different locations is clearly visible. This is why the sound character in the room varies at different listening locations. Now different rooms also affect the sound that we hear. In this example, or this image, we see two rather extreme examples. In the large cathedral on the left, the earliest reflections arrive after traveling very long distances. They generally arrive very late and too late to reinforce the direct sound. This makes the direct sound appear weak. The later reflections can travel very long distances before they reach the audience or any other absorbing surface. This creates a very long reverberation time and makes the sound appear to linger and to be very unclear. The small room is what we refer to as an anechoic chamber. All of the walls of this space are treated with absorption. The sound in this space is dominated by the direct sound. The sound quality is very clear with very little reverberation. And for a new visitor, this can seem very strange and even disorientating. So with these basics, let's move to some existing halls and discuss how they influence the sound for the audiences and the musicians who perform there. The Western European music tradition extends back over a thousand years. And for much of the early part of this time, the music was performed for religious ceremonies, court functions, and popular entertainment. Popular performance venues were existing spaces. The oldest surviving purpose-designed concert hall was built in Oxford in 1748. It seats an audience of 300, and it is still in use. By modern standards, this is a small venue. Many of the instruments today have been developed to be very loud, to be very stable in tuning and to be reliable to play. A solo piano can easily found overwhelming in this space. There are very few sound absorbing surfaces and the modern curtain on the right hand side of the image is a welcome addition. But for small ensembles, the sound in this space can be enchanting and allow delicate variation in tone color and dynamics. In history, there have been five principal shapes for a concert hall. The earliest was the shoebox. These halls are rectangular and have the stage near one end of the room. The audience is usually on a flat floor with sometimes balconies at the sides and the rear. 
The original hall on this site was destroyed in the Second World War, but the hall was rebuilt to the original design. It's still in use, and I've performed there. There are 1,570 seats on the flat stalls area, with two levels of narrow balconies along the sides and the rear wall. The side walls of these halls provide the early lateral reflections. This helps create envelopment and clarity in the sound. Some of the most famous of our older halls are of this design, the shoebox hall. The technology and materials needed to span the width of the space, typically 20 metres, was already established and readily available. These early rooms were designed for public events and to show off the opulence of the city states that funded them. High ceilings were a feature that appeared in response to the architectural fashions of the day. Only much later was it realized that these features created the acoustic character for which many of these rooms are now celebrated. For larger shoebox style halls, the rear seats become very distant from the stage. The sound here can become weak and the acoustic and visual impact of the performance is lost or reduced. The Salle Playel opened in Paris in 1927. This is a very different style of hall. This room has two large balconies at the rear to bring the audience at this, these locations closer to the stage. The ceiling is used to provide the early reflections to keep the sound strong and clear. The strongest reflections reaching the audience are these ceiling reflections. The walls and balcony fronts are not designed to distribute reflections to the whole audience. The side walls do not allow enough early reflections because of the location of these interfering balcony surfaces. As a result, the sound in this room is generally frontal and not enveloping. The Mann Auditorium in Tel Aviv opened in 1957. This design brings the audience closer to the stage using a different strategy. This room plan is fan-shaped. The rear of the hall is much wider than the stage. In order to prevent the reverberation time being too long, the volume is controlled with a low ceiling. As in the Salle Playel in Paris, the early reflections arrive from the ceiling. These arrive from straight ahead. The reflections from the side walls do not reach the audience in the best seats, indicated here. No lateral reflections can arrive here. The sound of these locations is weak and dry. The Berlin Philharmonie is the original of a design that has become known as the vineyard style hall. This name derives from the many European vineyards that are constructed on the steep banks of river valleys with odd shaped enclosures that allow the plantings to work with the land contours. This hall opened in 1961. The hall was designed so that the audience is seated close to the stage. The audience sits all around the conductor and the orchestra. The visual impact of the performance is very strong and most of the audience can see the expressions of the faces of the musicians. Despite this radical shape, for many of the seats, this hall works well acoustically. Early reflections are created by the ceiling, but also by the side wall surfaces that separate the groups of instruments. Sorry, just lost my place. However, there can be a major problem with the seating arrangement. Placing the audience all around the stage does not does allow the audience to see the conductor and musicians clearly, but not all the instruments project equally well in all directions. Consider a piano concerto, where the soloist is usually placed at the front of the stage. This image shows the plan of a hall with 50% of the audience behind the stage front, shaded here in red. Their ability to hear the piano in balance with the orchestra is severely compromised. And a similar issue is 
is found for solo singers. Now I'd like to turn to some of Marshall Day's concert hall designs to show some of the variety of halls that can be created. Sir Harold Marshall is recognised as one of the foremost innovators in this field. In 1967, he was the first to publish theories describing the importance of early reflections in the acoustic design of rooms. Further research led to deriving some of the room acoustic design parameters used internationally today. The basic concepts he established have been used in a wide variety of forms. The Perth Concert Hall is a rectangular shoebox with 1700 seats. In a national survey in the ABC Limelight magazine in 2011, the acoustics of this hall were chosen as the finest in the country. Coming from Perth, this hall has a lot of significance for me through my many performances there as soloist, orchestral leader and chamber musician, in addition to the many great concerts where I have heard wonderful artists perform. Since this time, our understanding of the acoustic principles of design, venue design, have allowed more creativity in the shape and use of materials. The Christchurch Town Hall with 2,500 seats is the first example of what has become known as a directed reflection sequence hall, the fifth of the five principal forms. The room is designed so that the early reflections and the reverberation are created independently. The surfaces suspended above the audience, these ones, create the early reflections. They are positioned so that the reflections arrive at the listener from the side. They're all slightly tilted, you can see here. These surfaces provide the clarity and envelopment in the sound. The volume at the top of the room above the reflection surfaces is essential to the room acoustics. Sound entering this volume meets only hard surfaces. Some of it is temporarily trapped here and reflects many times between the upper surfaces of the reflectors, the walls and the ceiling surfaces. This sound energy can re-enter the auditorium through the gaps between the reflectors. It is then heard by the audience as the reverberation. The Michael Fowler Centre in Wellington with 2200 seats is a development of the Christchurch design. The large suspended surfaces in this room diffuse the sound and they're angled so that the reflections arrive at the audience from across the hall. The Sim Sha Sui Cultural Center in Hong Kong opened in 1989. This venue includes this 2000 seat concert hall and a 1700 seat grand theater. The concert hall is the third iteration of this design typology and is the home of the Hong Kong Philharmonic Orchestra. With an unusual brief from the client, the Xi'an Concert Hall seats an audience of only 1,200 with a stage to accommodate, to accommodate a full-sized symphony orchestra. This is about two-thirds to a half of the typical capacity for a modern Western Concert Hall. The plan is a rectangular shoebox inserted into the outline of a traditional Tang style building. The acoustic design included enlarging the volume of the room so that the sound intensity would not be overwhelming. Most of the interior surfaces are designed to scatter or diffuse the reflected sound. In this way, the small dimensions of the room do not betray the limited volume which had to be created within the five storey building height limit imposed by the building permit. It has been described as one of the best acoustics in China. The Thousand Seat Concourse Concert Hall at Chatswood in Sydney has become a major performance venue for Sydney's North Shore. This flexible venue hosts the Willoughby Symphony Orchestra, the North Sydney I Steadfords and music competitions, and a wide range of schools and community events. The renovation of the 2400 seat Hamer Hall, which opened again in 2012, has received praise for the changes in acoustics. Marshall Day Acoustics worked with Kierkegaard Associates, based in Chicago, 
and ARM architects to rejuvenate the hall room acoustics of this hall, which is the performance home of the Melbourne Symphony Orchestra and regularly hosts many national and international touring ensembles, including the Australian Chamber Orchestra. The audience is seated in front of the stage in a stalls level with two balconies. Our work included redesign of the stage enclosure, okay, modification of the balcony seating layout, designing new wall surfaces to enhance the sound distribution within the hall, installation of a new sound system, and integration with new staging technical infrastructure. <clears throat> the Jiang Su Grand Theatre Concert Hall opened in 2017. For this project, Marshall Day was the acoustic consultant, not just for the concert hall, but also the 2300 seat opera house and the 1000 seat drama theatre. This concert hall is similar to a vineyard style hall with groups of seats and no overhanging balconies. The curved surfaces separating the seating areas and the dramatic ceiling are designed to distribute the early reflections across the entire audience areas to provide even clarity in all seats. The 1400 seat Chengdu City Concert Hall, which opened last year, is part of a large performing arts centre which includes a 1600 seat grand theatre, 400 seat drama theatre, 300 seat recital hall, rehearsal rooms and recording studios. This hall is a shoebox form with the large stalls area and smaller balconies along the sides and the rear of the room. There is seating for a choir and a European pipe organ installed behind the stage. The Ian Potter South Bank Centre, which opened in 2019, is a new building for the Melbourne Conservatorium of Music. The Hanson Dyer Auditorium is a 400 seat hall for recitals and smaller scale concerts with up to 25 performers. Seats behind the stage can be used for choirs when required. This venue is designed for more intimate musical performances, but with operable variable acoustic banners, it is also well suited as a venue for guest speakers and for university lectures. This image is the winning plan for the international design competition for the 1600 seat Sverdlovsk Philharmonic Concert Hall. This design was developed with Zaha Hadid Architects in London. The curved surfaces of the balcony fronts provide an illustration of the strategy used to distribute the early reflections to create clarity and envelopment. This rendered image of the Sverdlovsk Hall shows the surface finishes required to create conditions for strong reverberation within the hall. This supports the blending of sound from the many instruments of a full-sized symphony orchestra. Complex surfaces like these can be created using 3D computer models and then cast using glass reinforced plaster or machine from laminated timber or bamboo. The Philharmonie de Paris, designed with Atelier Jean Nouvel, opened in 2015. This hall shows how an asymmetric curved interior design language can create a dramatic result. However, this appearance hides a new breakthrough in acoustic design. This room operates as two nested halls. The suspended curved ceiling reflectors, here and around the edge, and the walls behind the audience, these walls here, define the inner space. These surfaces create the clarity in the sound for the audience. In this section view, we see how the audience is immersed in the reverberant sound. The balconies are floating inside this room and the audience enters through large voids which have been highlighted in this image. The volume at the top of the room works in a similar way to the volume above the reflectors in the Christchurch Town Hall. But in this hall, the, this volume extends behind and around the audience. In this room, the sound can re-enter 
this inner space, this inner audience space from behind the audience through, here, through the gaps here. This creates a transparency to the orchestral sound that has been widely praised. The photograph shows the view from into the hall from one of the walkways through the outer volume. These are the walls that form the outer reverberant space, looking through one of the walls behind the audience into the rest of the hall. Room acoustics has been widely described as one of the dark arts. I have tried to show that there are some well-founded principles behind our designs. Clearly, we've not been able to go into much detail in this introduction, but there is a lot of analysis that we undertake in the design of a new venue. This involves creating and testing 3D computer models, and some of this could be a topic for future discussion. In conclusion, I hope that we have shown you some of the thought that goes into the planning of a new concert hall, but also the incredible variety of spaces that can be created from the understanding of the acoustic design. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Pete. Um, we've had a few questions come through in the chat box and I'll encourage anyone who has any to write them down there in the Q&A section at the bottom of the screen. So Pete, one question that's come through is, uh, how do you find the perception of the public compares to that of the design team or perhaps the performers? So for example, with a refurbishment such as Hamer Hall, um, does the public often have an opinion or commentary on the changes of the acoustics? Liam, the public always has an opinion and they've all got, they have a perfect right to be listened to. Um, yes, that's, it's a very strong part. And part of our strategy was to assess the hall before and after the renovation of Hamer Hall. We invited a, a qualified listening panel of experts and uh, to, to fill in questionnaire, questionnaires, but also uh, we spoke to a lot of the musicians who perform and use this space and who are very familiar with it as an extension of their own musical instruments. The, um, the, the use of questionnaires has been well established in our practice and we also did it, uh, it first in Auckland when we established, um, uh, when we introduced a new um, enhancement system to the to the main theatre there. So yes, we do try and listen to that. And of course, the, um, the critics always have a, have a big input and a very public opinion into how a hall is received by the public. Excellent, thanks for that. Um, another question is, that's come through, is how, or what are the major um, acoustic considerations with regards to designing uh, concert halls for different kinds of uh, performers, for example, a symphony orchestra or a rock band? We have to consider this quite carefully these days because there is more pressure on almost every new venue to become a multi-purpose venue, to host concerts more than can be supplied by just one orchestra or even a group of touring orchestras. And so many, many venues now host a very wide range of performances. Now, a symphony orchestra revels and uh, is supported by a rich reverberance in the hall. This very same reverberance can certainly get in the way of engineers who are trying to produce a highly engineered sound using loudspeakers. And so we, what we have to do is to control the degree of reverberation in the room. This can be done in two ways. One by controlling the volume of the room and the second way is generally to control the amount of acoustic absorption in the room. Controlling the volume of the room is rarely attempted because it involves very major and expensive um, engineering feats. But um, for instance, the hall in Kuala Lumpur, uh, the Petronas Symphony Hall, um, has the, the ceiling on a very, very large piston and can, so the room can be changed in volume by up to about 30%. Um, that's very much a minority example and a much more common solution, design solution, is to install operable acoustic banners, which are effectively curtains or drapes, which can be installed when required to reduce the reverberation time in the room. Yes, I see. Okay, so here's another one. Um, 
how would you choose a seat for any given hall? Would you always sit in the same section or would you uh, choose to move around when you went to a different concert? I always enjoyed moving around in a hall that I'm not familiar with um, because that, then that way you can assess what, um, what the possibilities are for, for different types of repertoire. Recently, I bought some seats in London for, at the Festival Hall for a Bruckner symphony. <clears throat> now, I happen to know that this symphony involves a very large brass section and I wanted to be enveloped by the frontal sound, so I, I booked the tickets at the front of the balcony, halfway along the hall. That maximised the, um, the amount of reverberance in the room, but also gave me a sort of a full frontal experience of the sound of the orchestra coming as a very dramatic event, which suited that type of repertoire. Perhaps for a more intimate Mozart piano concerto, I'll choose a seat much closer to the front where this sound would be a little bit drier and more direct, especially from the soloist. Can you touch on again, um, a, you mentioned very briefly the artificial reverberation systems. How, in, in brief terms, do they really work? We now have two established ways of changing the acoustic conditions in a hall. One, as I've indicated, is to introduce absorption in the, in the hall, and that reduces the amount of sound energy in the room. It absorbs energy. It takes energy out of the room. This works quite well when the natural acoustic of the room is very full with a long reverberation time, and then we can make the sound drier. Technologically, we can now do the opposite. We can add energy to a room. We do this through a a series of, or a whole array of loudspeakers in a very controlled fashion. Um, in order for this to be effective, we basically need a room which is quite dry with a relatively short reverberation time. And by changing the signals that are fed into the loudspeakers, we can give the impression of a longer reverberation time or a sound, or we can alter the sound quality in other more flexible ways, like perhaps shifting the at the apparent image position in the room, changing, uh, adding reflections in the room. We could actually add a lot of distortion to the sound of the room and make it sound completely unnatural, as you can in a lot of electronic soundscapes these, way, these days. Okay, thanks very much for that, Pete. Um, I think we're just about out of time. I'm sure that as people kind of think about all these things that you've discussed today, they might come up with a few more questions or queries. Uh, what's the best way that they can get into touch um, should any further queries come up or if they wish to discuss anything further? They all know where to find me. <laughs> okay, thank you very much everybody uh, for attending today's webinar and we hope to be in touch uh, sometime soon. And thanks, Peter, for a fantastic presentation. Cheers. Have a great day. Bye. <laughs>